Welcome, I'm Daniel Scribner, and this is Outliers, where every week I sit down with an entrepreneur, investor, or iconoclast to dissect what they've mastered and how they see the world. Digging deep to find the ideas, patterns, and perspectives that we can all put to use in our own lives. And today I'm thrilled to have Dan Roller of Moran Capital Management on the show. Moran Capital Management is a boutique, values-driven investment manager that I've been following intently for the last few years. I love the way that Dan sees the world, and I never miss reading one of his investor letters. In this episode, we go deep on how becoming a better investor is similar to training for an Ironman competition, why Dan focuses on what he calls buy and build companies, and some of his favorite historic and recent examples there, his approach to investing in special situations, and what defines a good or bad opportunity. And I get his thoughts on SPACs and why he sees some interesting opportunities in the world today. Dan is a remarkable investor. Before he founded Moran Capital Management in 2015, he worked as an analyst for over a decade at firms like Credit Suisse First Boston, Impala Asset Management, Avesta Capital Advisors, and Scopus Asset Management. As always, for links to everything discussed, as well as the show notes and the full transcript of our conversation, visit outliers.fm. And finally, here's the bit where I remind you that nothing we discuss should be considered investment or financial advice. This conversation is for informational and hopefully entertainment purposes only. Please do your own research and come to your own conclusions or speak to your financial advisor before putting a dollar into anything we discuss. And now let's jump into this incredible episode. Dan, I've been looking to this conversation for a long time, so thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. I thought maybe a cool place to start would be talking a little bit about how we met. And that was a couple years ago. I happened to be in New York for this MOI Global event called Lattice Work. I might ask you to set up what MOI Global is in a second. But, you know, I know that we've both been a part of MOI Global. It's been an incredible experience. And then after meeting, I obviously followed your investor letters. And it's just been really fascinating to, to kind of follow along. But can you start just by setting up, I guess, a little bit of an introduction to MOI Global and how you've enjoyed being a part of that community? MOI Global, the MOI stands for the Manual of Ideas, and it was put together by a gentleman by the name of John Mihaizovich. I'm probably butchering that name. It's essentially a place for value-oriented investors, a community for value-oriented investors to come together, share ideas, and, and interact through a series of different types of events. So there are podcasts and in-person events and newsletters, so just various ways for folks to get together. And so I've actually presented at, at a handful of their ideas or a handful of their idea events over the years. I've participated in others, learned a lot from the community. So it's a great community of value-oriented investors, and I would recommend anyone interested to check it out. Yeah, and I think the website, I guess I could check it really quickly, but I think though, if you just Google search MOI Global, you do have to apply for a membership, but they have a lot of free stuff. So for anyone that that sounds interesting to definitely go check it out. I thought it would be good. So we're going to spend all of today talking about your firm, Moran Capital, and how you approach investing there and the fund that you run and some of the fascinating investments that you're in. But before we get too deep into that, I thought it would be great to just, if you could just do a little bit of a sketch of your background, because you have done a lot of things. You worked for a lot of different asset management firms as an analyst before founding it. So can you just talk about, I guess, your background and the kind of period leading up to founding Moran? So I'm a Denver native. I went to school at Duke University. I studied electrical engineering and computer science. And really how I got into investing was while I was at Duke, I joined the investment club. There was a sign on one of the bulletin boards around campus that said, make money. And it was an advertisement for the investment club. And so I turned up, you know, I had never really done any investing of substance prior to that point. I turned up at the first meeting. I was really kind of hooked right away. And so, you know, I was an eager freshman who was the only eager freshman who took the board of the investment club up on their offer that any member of the club could could attend the board meetings and just sit in the back and listen. And so I started attending the board meetings of the investment club and started to learn and listen. And eventually the following year, I joined the board and then I wound up running it as one of the two co-presidents my junior and senior year. So it, that arc of over four years at college while I was learning how to code and studying computer science and electrical engineering, I was also really digging into investments as a hobby and, and participating in the investment club. And so that's really what launched my career was the interest gained at that you know kind of serendipitous encounter. And so I started gearing my life experience towards investing, doing various internships, and then moving to New York directly after college to go work in the industry. 
One thing I want to make sure that we touch on is you majored in electrical engineering and computer science. And in a lot of ways, that seems, you know, related to investing, or at least you're going to use some of those same kind of mental models and skills. But can you talk a little bit about was investing this thing you discovered and then you just fell in love with it? And how does that background play into how you invest today? Electrical engineering, in a way, is applied math. It's applying math to the physical world of signals and systems. But computer science is an interesting way of thinking, and especially computer programming is an interesting way of thinking, where you have this set of tools in the form of a programming language, right? You have very basic commands. And out of those very basic commands, you can build up really complex systems, right? More complex than you can imagine using you know, classes and layering and various constructs. It's a series of mental models that have been really important to me in my career as an investor, but not because I use coding to help me invest, right? I'm not writing algorithmic trading programs or something like that. So I think it's more this, the constructs of how do you start with these very basic tools, these basic commands, right? How do you name a variable and get it to do something? It's been a very valuable background to have, despite not being directly applicable day to day in investing. There really isn't a direct connection. Investing was something that I think, like you said, I just kind of discovered. I read the value investing canon. You know, I read Buffett and Graham and Munger and Phil Fisher and every book I could get my hands on in college. And so, you know, value investing resonated with me right away. We could talk about value investing and what that means later on, because I think that a lot of people have this mindset that there's either value investing or growth investing. And I don't think that's the right framework. It was one of those things where I was just immediately hooked on this idea of analyzing businesses and studying companies. And yeah, so I ran with it. Can you set up just some of the groups that you worked with, that you worked at kind of before founding Moran? And I guess anything notable, anything worth calling out, any lessons learned, anything that applied in the future? After college, like I said, I moved to New York and my first job was at Credit Suisse First Boston in the equity research department. And I was studying the transportation sector and particularly the freight railroads, kind of a seemingly boring industry to many, but also a critical part of the global infrastructure, cyclical, but also elements of stability, capital intensive. So interesting place to get my start, but really I wanted to be on the buy side, right? I wanted to be in in investment firms. And I had the opportunity to, because my boss left Credit Suisse to go help start a firm, I had the chance to kind of go over to the buy side after just a year. And so over the next 11 years in New York, I was, as you mentioned, at a couple of different firms on the buy side. The firm that I joined my boss at was called Impala Asset Management. It was founded by Bob Bishop, who had previously been the CIO or very senior at both uh, Soros and Tiger, right? He worked for Julian Robertson. So you could say that Impala was a Tiger Cub. And that was really where I laid the groundwork of thinking about being an investor, thinking about value. It was a firm that focused a lot on cyclical companies. And so we thought about peak earnings, trough earnings. We thought about replacement costs, you know, the old Wilbur Ross framework of buying businesses at a third of replacement cost. We thought a lot about buying businesses when they didn't have any earnings. So the PE, if you looked at your screen, was infinity or you know hundreds of times because it was at a cyclical trough. And then maybe selling them when the PE on the screen was 10 times because it was at a cyclical peak. It was a great foundation. And that's where I really made the transition from being a more junior analyst to taking on a more senior analyst role and then kind of launching my career onto becoming a portfolio manager thereafter. And I think that one of the things that the Tiger mindset teaches you, that framework of Tiger Global and Julian Robertson, is that when you have an investment thesis, when you think about an investment, you need a way to track whether it's working out without just looking at the stock price. And so we thought a lot about trying to come up with the right metrics to track to determine whether our thesis was on track without just looking at the stock price, because the stock price could do lots of things in the short term. And so, you know, you don't necessarily want to determine your success or judge whether you were correct in something or not based on what the stock price does in the short term. And so I think that was something that, you know, I've carried with me is trying to have this framework for determining whether something is working out without looking at the stock price. And it might be based on earnings or volumes or pricing or or whatever the thesis is based on, but it's not what the stock price is doing in the short term. 
it's fascinating. So it's like identifying some sort of an underlying metric that will be pointing in the right direction if things are playing out. And then you're looking at that for signal because yeah, obviously the stock price itself is just a ton of noise most of the time. Exactly. And it may be improving a competitive advantage or strengthening a brand. So it might not even show up in earnings in the short term. Maybe a company is investing more. And so I think spending time to think about how you're going to determine whether something is working out or not is something that you know some people spend not enough time on. And that was something that was really drilled into me at an early stage in my career. It's fascinating. Is I go off on a tangent on a second, but over the weekend, you know, I was doing some research, and a company that I haven't looked at in a little while is Bic in France, which makes lighters and pens. And since I last looked, the business has definitely deteriorated. You know, and their earnings are starting to decline, and they have a whole deck around kind of how they're gearing up to with a series of goals around 2022. And it seems like this would be a perfect instance there because effectively, it's a business with plenty going for it, but it certainly had some short-term kind of headwinds. They're saying they're going to turn it around, and so I don't know trying to take that approach and think about what would some of those underlying metrics be so you know that that's happening. It seems super fascinating. <laughs> it's not easy to think about short-term metrics and quarters can be noisy and you know what's the right time period over which to determine these metrics, which is why this is a challenging endeavor. <laughs> You have that 11-year period where you're learning a ton. You're at a handful of different firms. It sounds like you went from an analyst to being more on the buy side. And you eventually go on to found, you know, Moran Capital Management. And I'm always curious, you know, one, I imagine that's obviously just a super critical point in your career. Take us inside your head. Was there a moment that you felt like you were finally ready? Was it just taking a leap? And do you have anything to share about what it felt like to finally kind of launch off on your own endeavor? After Impala, I worked at a firm called Scopus Asset Management, which was also in New York as a portfolio manager, managing maybe three to $500 million as part of a broader portfolio. It was great. The team was great. I had a lot of autonomy. I was able to invest for the most part in the way that I thought was the right way to invest with you know a long time horizon, concentrated portfolio. But at the same time, doing this on my own was always something that I wanted to do. And I think that there are still various institutional constraints or various changes that someone would make if they really had the license to set up a firm to do it exactly the way that they would want. And so I think there's a combination of factors. You know, one is I had the personal capital saved up to be able to take the risk. This was in the second half of 2014 and early 2015. I had a four-year-old, I think, and a newborn. We moved from New York back to Denver, had our second baby. And I launched the firm all in like a six month period. So it was certainly a risk, but it was a, a risk that I thought I had to take based on, you know, my drive and desire to ultimately, you know, do this for myself and do it the way that I wanted to do it. You asked about the arc of my career working at various funds in New York. And I think there's a couple commonalities. A few I mentioned. One is trying to invest in a concentrated manner, trying to invest with a long time horizon. But another angle that was a recurring theme or another element that was a recurring theme through that time was the focus on special situations. So when I was in New York managing larger pools of capital, there's a lot of competition, right? There's 30 analysts covering Exxon Mobil or Dow Chemical or you know Microsoft or Apple. How do you get an edge? And so one thing that even when I was focused on larger companies, the way that I attempted to get an edge was in looking at special situations. And so we can come back to this. But what I mean by special situations is basically some type of corporate event, be it a spinoff, a merger, a change in management, change in industry structure, rights offerings, warrants, you know, a whole laundry list of various corporate events that can cause a company to be mispriced. And so I was focusing on not just where I could find value, not just where I could find growth. How could I find them for a cheap price? And typically or frequently, it was because there was something external going on that was creating the opportunity. You know, I brought the rigor developed at working at these funds over the years, combined with this thesis about concentration and a long time horizon and various elements. But I brought that with Moran to the small and micro cap part of the market. And so basically I said, what hunting ground do I want to compete in? Do I want to compete against firms with scores of analysts, huge research budgets, or do I want to compete in a part of the market where they just can't play in the small and micro cap part of the world? And I really do think that it's a less efficient part of the market. To be frank, there's a lot of low quality companies that are small and micro caps. And so there's perhaps more that you have to weed through, but there are also these gems of companies that I think fly below the radar screen of many other firms. And so that's really what I, you know, the thought process was and the thesis was to setting up Moran is to apply the frameworks that I had developed to 
a less competitive part of the market. I'd love to dig into two things that you covered there. And the first one, I guess, would be on choosing your hunting ground well, which I think is just a fascinating idea. Something I've been thinking about a lot recently is how most success, if you really boil it down, this could be success of a fund or success of a company. If you boil it down, you know there are often all these kind of surface level things that are cited around why that success happens. But at the end of the day, typically, if you drill down far enough, it's a structural success. And an example of that would be you choosing to hunt in this very inefficient part of the market. I imagine that is a potential structural advantage. So can you just talk a little bit about how that's played out and how that's worked for you so far and any lessons learned or any insights? I've thought about what my areas of competitive advantage are, and I do think there are structural advantages. There's a structural advantage to my firm being small. Right now, we manage just under $20 million. I think the plan is to cap the fund at under $100 million to be able to continue to to play in this hunting ground. And so I think that a smaller amount of capital is a huge structural advantage versus competing against firms that are managing billions. And again, if you're managing a billion plus or tens or hundreds of billions, the universe of investment opportunities is smaller, right? You can't make a meaningful position in a $200 million company if you're managing $15 billion or something like that. And so I think a small size is a structural advantage. I think the fact that I'm a single decision maker is a structural advantage versus you know having an investment committee or teams of people that are all trying to decide whether to invest in a company or not. I think that I've set this up to where there's a single decision maker, and I think that's an advantage. So I do think that choosing the hunting ground, choosing the size, choosing the approach, another structural advantage is the alignment of my limited partners, right? the alignment of my capital partners. The vast majority of our partners are in a five-year lockup share class. And so they understand what I'm doing. They understand that I'm investing in smaller cap companies, which admittedly may be you know, more volatile, but with a long time horizon and they share that time horizon. And so it gives me the license to be opportunistic, take advantage of volatility. Whereas I think some fund managers, if they have monthly liquidity, maybe their partners are asking for their capital back at exactly the wrong time, as opposed to letting them invest through the cycle. So I thought a lot about how to set things up structurally to give me the best chance of succeeding, right? To give me the best odds to outperform. And so far, I think those decisions have been important. You know, I could have raised more capital, I think, on less good terms, but it's been important to me to, you know, kind of have this partnership mentality where my partners understand what I'm doing. And it's been great. It could also be a structural advantage, I imagine, but just having that concentrated portfolio. And I I wanted to talk about that for a second because it's something I've been thinking about a lot recently and I've been looking at different models of it. And I would just love to hear your take and how you think about concentration, how you think about the total number of positions you want to have in a portfolio and how you think about weighting. And I know those are very big questions, so we can just stay a higher level. But the reason I'm curious is, one, it seems like concentration is, it's not ubiquitous in terms of what it means. You know, For some people, it means they only hold 10 positions. For others, it means that they maybe have a portfolio of 30 or 50 positions, but there's a ton of concentration in the the top 10. So can you talk a little bit about, I guess, your kind of thought process and perspective there and, and how you approach that at Moran? Philosophically high level, the idea is that your third best idea or your first best idea is probably a lot better than your 50th best idea. At some point, there's diminishing returns to adding incremental securities into a portfolio. And I think we're probably all familiar with various studies that have been done that show that at some point around 20 positions, there's a real fall off in the benefits of diversification. I know I have friends that have five stock portfolios. I've heard of funds that you know might have one position that's 60% of the fund or something like that. So I think there's a, you know, a variety of approaches here. Typically, I would say that we have run with 10 positions that have made up 90% of the capital. Right now, our top handful of positions are probably between 8 and 12 or 8 and 13% of the capital. So I think it allows us to focus on our best ideas, but at the same time, there are benefits to diversification. And sometimes my seventh best idea actually does outperform what I think is my best idea. So concentration isn't beneficial for the sake of concentration. It's probably better to have more positions if they're equally good, but that's a huge constraint, right? If you really had 100 positions that you thought were 100 baggers or were just, you know, like amazing risk reward, it's probably better to have all of those than just two positions, but it's rare to find really good ideas. And so I think that, you know, where I've come out on the balance between 
how many truly good ideas I have at any given time and allowing for some diversification because we'll all be wrong on things occasionally is kind of that 10 position, 10 core position sweet spot. But again, the special situation element can lead to smaller positions or shorter term trades. Or right now I have a basket of a handful of security. So we have a longer tail at the moment. We have a basket of maybe eight or 10 stocks that make up. Actually, right now it's 20% of the portfolio. So I think at times things move around. Part of the advantage of being a single decision maker and doing things that the way that I think are right is it allows for opportunism. And if I see an opportunity to have a basket of a number of things that make up 20%, I can do it. There's no set rules. I haven't gone out and said, we're only going to be in this style box, right? We're going to have 80 to 100 stocks. We're going to be in this quadrant on the style box and allowing for some room for opportunism in the market is important and shifting sources of value, shifting markets. You can't be too rigid for too long in this business. Love that you have that approach. I know not everybody does, but (laughs) I love that you have an approach where you can scale and you can be nimble and you can pursue things that are seeming to emerge in the market. And I think we're definitely at a point in time now where there's some interesting things. And I think we might loop back around to this later on the interview, but there's some interesting things that have been happening in the market. I think the widespread popularity of SPACs is one of them and we might loop around there, but it's super interesting. I'm curious. So we talked a little bit about what that portfolio looks like. One question, and this may be a shot in the dark and you may not even have a great sense of this, but something I wanted to try to capture was you are managing at the end of the day an incredibly concentrated portfolio, but that doesn't mean you're only following a very small number of companies or you're only looking at a very small number of companies. I guess, can you talk a little bit about how many companies you might look at in a year or in a quarter? Because I imagine, you know, there's probably a dual track of there's always ongoing research and exploration, and then you also have a portfolio to manage. Can you talk a little bit about that overlap on the research side? So the top of the funnel with respect to the research process is is very broad. It's not particularly systematic. So I'm not running screens. I've never had success running a screen of, you know, show me all the stocks with a price to book of this or a price to earnings of this. That's just never worked for me. So the top of the funnel is pretty ad hoc. It's a lot of following interests, right? Like I'll read an article or I'll be studying a company and I'll learn about one of their suppliers or I'll learn about a competitor or I'll have an investment in one region of the world in an industry. And then I'll learn that there's a company doing something similar in Sweden or in Korea or something like that. It's funny because a lot of allocators, there's this idea of asking the question, is your investment process repeatable? Do you have a repeatable process? And in a way, the answer is yes, it's repeatable, but that doesn't mean that it's systematic or based on, again, going back to the computer science, based on algorithms or based on a quantitative approach or screening. A good investment comes about when you're combining a prepared mind, you're combining this baseline of preparation of having studied business models, frameworks. There's an element of pattern recognition. And so I think you kind of need to just sit there and let a lot of things come through the top of the filter. There's a lot of value that's added between the top of the funnel or the top of the filter and the bottom of the fault filter, not in screening the universe for the top of the filter. A key to learning is interest. I think it's really hard to learn something that you're not interested in. So if you are passionate about something, if you go down a rabbit hole, it's really much easier to learn about that topic. And so I think interest drives a lot of what I do. I've probably encountered fantastic investment opportunities, but for whatever reason, they just didn't light that fire for me. And I didn't pursue them to the same way that maybe it did for someone else. And so I think that there does have to be this element of passion or interest or curiosity that drives part of the process. I'll miss things that I'm not interested in, but then the things that I'm interested in, I'll probably study harder than anyone else and put two and two together on those. And so I think there are certain themes, certain elements. One common theme across our investments over the last five plus years I've been running the fund is this idea of buy and build, this framework of quote unquote buy and build of companies that are pursuing organic growth as well as acquisition driven growth. And we can come back to this and talk a little bit about some of the ways that that's manifest in my portfolio. I probably look at hundreds of companies a year. I think I have research files on over 400 companies. Now that may just be three notes on a Word document from something at some point, or it could be hundreds of files and updated Excel models and different things. So the top of the funnel is very broad. I read a lot of esoteric materials. I read a lot of books. I read a lot of things that people probably 
wouldn't think about being pertinent to investing. But some of the most powerful frameworks that I've come across in recent years have been from books written by physicists or books written by various authors that aren't related to investing. Do you mind sharing one of those? So one book that, that's been very powerful for me and that I've reread several times, it's a book uh, by the, the physicist David Deutsch called The Beginning of Infinity. It's a fantastic book. Um, it covers a lot of ground. It's pretty dense. There's parts of it that are quite dense about quantum gravity and quantum physics and the structure of the universe, the structure of the world. But he gets into computing, universal classical computers, the mind as a computer, and then he gets into political structures, the nature of beauty. I mean, it's philosophical in a way. It may have sung to me more than it might for others, given my background in electrical engineering, which, like I said, is applied math and applied physics. But I think it's accessible to a fairly wide audience. It might be somewhat challenging, but it's just a book that probably gave me more to think about, more mental models than certainly any book on investing that I've read in recent years. And it's funny, I think that you know when you're first learning to invest, and when I was in college, first learning to invest, I read every book on investing I could get my hands on, behavioral finance or physics or history or other topics. I love that because for me, one thing that I think I've often felt like I'm in the minority on, but is just this belief that at the end of the day, everything's interconnected. So what we're for a lot of people, you know, are like, well, why would I waste my time? I want to be more successful in investing. So I should just be reading more annual reports or more letters from other fund managers or doing more due diligence on my own. But in my mind, I'm really with you there where I think that what you're doing is just taking your thinking and turning it really three-dimensional by having all of these other related ideas and related lenses that you can use to look at stuff. Is that how you think about it? And I guess any thoughts on that concept of everything being related and no worries about not just studying more <laughs> in your specific area? It's critical to just read and think really broadly to be a good investor. You know, this concept of quote unquote mental models is perhaps thrown around a little bit too much these days. And it's kind of a joke on some circles that people have gone too far down the rabbit hole of studying quote unquote mental models, but it really is an important framework. And I think that coming up with a good investment thesis is the combination of a prepared mind of having some kind of a framework, some kind of a lattice work on which to understand the world with the idea. The idea comes through the top of your filter and you need some process to understand the business. And so, you know, the construct of the business model, the network effects. And if you haven't studied broadly, maybe it's human behavior, maybe it's psychology, maybe it's network effects or other things. I think that you're likely not going to be in a position to, to determine whether a company will be in a position to be successful over time. So I like reading business, what I call business biographies. So a couple that come to mind, I loved uh, Biz Stone's book, about Twitter. He was one of the co-founders of Twitter called Things a Little Bird Told Me. I thought that was a fantastic business biography. And then I, I also really liked Creativity Inc. about Pixar. That was a great one. So physics, math, biology. I've been reading a lot of biology lately, how mitochondria work and cell biology is super fascinating. And again, there's probably no direct relationship to investing, but I think that you never know like where some synapses are going to connect in the brain and spark an idea. I'm just going to start repeating that going forward. You never know, <laughs> you never know when some synapses are going to connect. I want to ask one more question and then we'll dive deeper into kind of buy and build and some of the strategies that you really focus on at Moran. One of the questions I wanted to ask was we were preparing for this and we were talking about what we might discuss. And one thing that came up was this idea of that investing is the process of building up and that there's some similarities and overlap with something like training for an Ironman. Can you flesh that out a little bit more? In college, I was a runner and I started just going for runs, like going to run around the golf course or something. And eventually wound up training for marathons. And then I guess endurance athletics has always been something I've been interested in. After lots and lots of running, I started kind of beating myself up and beating my knees up. And I decided that a triathlon would be maybe less damage to the knee joints or something. And so I took an unconventional approach of doing the following items in the following order. I signed up for an Ironman and then went out and bought a bike that weekend and went for my first ride. So I kind of jumped straight into the deep end with this idea that I would try to do an Ironman triathlon. But what I found with training, and this is similar to running and a lot of other tasks, is that the first weekend I went out and I rode for 10 miles and I rode my bike for 10 miles. And then the next weekend I went out and I rode for 15 miles. 
and then 20 miles and 25 and 30. It is interesting the way that the human body is super adaptable, but this slow building up of endurance, strength, bodybuilders or strength weightlifters follow a similar approach in a linear progression. You lift 300 pounds and then the next week you try to do 302.5 pounds or 305 pounds. And so with training for the Ironman, I think the bike ride is 120 odd miles. It's funny. It's been a while. You can build up slowly and the, the body adapts. And so again, in various pursuits in life, I think that you can kind of get this compounding effect. And I think knowledge compounds in a similar way and studying business models compounds in a similar way. So, you know, maybe the first time you study a semiconductor company, you don't even know what questions to ask. You read an annual report, you start to think about some frameworks for the industry, how many competitors there are, what are the margins like, what's the margin structure like. And then after a year of studying semiconductor companies, you, you can just be you know, in a different universe with respect to the knowledge. It's so daunting to think, oh, how am I going to ever do you know, a 12-hour race where you swim for an hour, then you ride your bike for six hours, and then you run for four hours or something like that. And you can break it down into little components. You know, This weekend, I need to go ride 40 miles, and the next weekend, it's 50, and you just build up. Charlie Munger called it a Lollapalooza effect, but you can create this you know, dramatic extreme effect by building up in small pieces. And we talked about computer programming at the beginning. Again, you take a very basic set of commands, for loops, the naming of variables, the four mathematical symbols. There really aren't that complicated a set of rules that are available to computer programmers, but you can just build up, build a small function, and then a series of functions in a class, and then a series of classes in an object, and then a series of objects in a program, and a series of programs relating to each other. And you can create this really dramatic, complex system out of these little building blocks. And so I think there's some commonalities with you know training for endurance events, building strength, and then with building knowledge and building a framework to have success at various pursuits. And so I don't want to overstretch the parallels. I don't want to try to overstate the parallels between training for endurance events and computer programming and building up of knowledge with respect to investing or other topics. But I do think there are some commonalities that are interesting to think about. I think there are a lot of commonalities. And I think one of those is something that I love that you focus on that I also find fascinating are companies that take this buy and build approach. And maybe in a second, we'll get into a few of those examples, but it's both a small universe, but it's also not that small. It's a somewhat popular model. And so one of the things I wanted to dig into there is we talked about this kind of very classic example of Warren Kanders and, and Armor Holding. Would you mind sharing for people maybe just the foundation? What do you think is really interesting and compelling about buy and build companies, and then maybe to set up an example of one, if you can flesh out that armor holding example. The term may have originated with a company called Watsco, which was a, or still is an HVAC supply company. And so they talked about this concept of buy and build, of buying additional HVAC companies in different regions, as well as, as organic growth. And I think you could apply the framework to lots of different companies and some companies might like the term better than others. But it's funny, you know, people ask, who are your role models as investors? Who are the people that influenced your approach? And I think there's some famous investors that people might point to. But one of my real mentors in the business was this gentleman named Warren Kanders, as you mentioned. And he took a, a little micro cap business called Armor Holdings. In fact, at the time it was called American Body Armor. It was a company that made bulletproof vests, holsters, you know, accessories for the law enforcement industry. And I think when he came onto the scene, he bought a, a large block of the company, you know, 20, 30%. It was tiny. I think it had a $5 million book value, sub $10 million of revenues. I think it was like 78 cents a share or something like that. 75 cents a share, I think was his purchase price on the block trade that brought him into the company. And over the course of 12 years, he turned it into well over a hundred bagger and wound up selling the business for $88. So it was a hundred bagger in 12 years. You know, I think it's a 45, 50% Kager. And it's $88 a share. So from 75 to 88. 75 cents to $88, over a hundred X. And the strategy was this buy and build. So you have this small business, eight, $10 million of sales, not making a lot of money. And you think about both organic growth as well as value creating M&A. You know, this was an extreme example. I think you probably, we probably shouldn't all base our worldview on the possibility of recreating this. 
right next door to the concept of buy and build is the concept of a levered rollup. The world is littered with levered rollups that got too levered and failed. And so I think there's kind of a fine distinction there between the categories for success and the extent to which a company is using leverage is a critical component here. And it's an unheralded industry. Law enforcement accessories, they started doing up-armored limousines for dictators in various countries or politicians in Brazil or different things. So, you know, they had this amazing result without, you know, it wasn't a dot-com startup. It wasn't Google or Apple. And obviously there's been fantastic returns in parts of the technology sector, but there's also been fantastic returns in monster beverage and monster energy drinks and various other parts of the market that people don't associate with that level of success. It's a great exercise. If you look at, you know, the top 30 returning stocks of the last 20 or 30 years, it's not just these tech darlings, right? It's not the top five handful of tech names that would come to the top of your lips. Now they may be on there, but there's examples across many, many industries. It's not certainly been our exclusive strategy, but again, you think about these frameworks and these areas where things rhyme, these buy and build strategies have been something that we've come back to and and invested in over time. And so one of our top holdings for the last five plus years, since shortly after I launched the fund, has been a company called Claris Corporation, which is Warren Kander's next vehicle. So he sold Armor Holdings. He has now been building in the public markets this vehicle called Claris Corp with a similar framework, right? Organic growth, building brands organically, and then smart bolt-on acquisitions. We own one in the non-sugar sweetener business called Whole Earth Brands, which recently came out of a SPAC or a busted SPAC. It was a SPAC that broke deal. So kind of this idea of a special situation leading to a core holding with a buy and build framework. We own a company called American Outdoor Brands, which was a spinoff from Smith & Wesson, Smith & Wesson's outdoor products group. Again, it's kind of a special situation creating the opportunity, the spinoff, there were forced sellers, but they're pursuing this buy and build framework. And then another top holding, again, this is a portfolio of roughly 10 core positions. About half of them are kind of in this buy and build framework, but another long time holding is a company called Turning Point Brands, which is in the other tobacco products and tobacco related products business. It came onto my radar screen initially as a broken IPO, it came public and it broke deal price. You get these forced sellers, people that played the deal, quote unquote, and it didn't work. And so they're just moving on, just selling out. And so again, kind of a special situation, creating the opportunity, but with this buy and build mindset. So it's definitely been a recurring theme. There's other themes that we focused on. Yeah, but buy and build, I think has been a very interesting part of our hunting ground and something that I now have, again, a number of mental models around that I think helps me evaluate those companies. I think one thing that I find fascinating about this space is when you list off some of those names, if people aren't familiar with the brands underneath each of those companies, those companies sound like weird shell corporation <laughs> names almost. And, you know, and then you dig in and you actually learn these incredible brands are ultimately owned by this kind of overarching entity. So we'll come back to that in a second. But one of the things that I wanted to dive into, just going one layer deeper, is kind of, again, maybe thinking structurally, what helps these to work? And I think one of those is this idea you talked about that there's organic growth, plus then they're bolting on these acquisitions. And some people refer to that as inorganic growth, that value added. And there's a bunch of different terms there. But you know, clearly, there it seems like there needs to be this engine in the business, which is that there is something there that is naturally growing. That's then spinning off cash that allows them to reinvest in bolt-on businesses, which then spins off more cash. Am I getting that right? And can you talk about that kind of engine that helps power? That's a great way of thinking about it. You know, we call it a flywheel as well as getting this flywheel working. And I think that's exactly right. You have a core business that's growing, that's hopefully spinning off cash, not requiring cash to grow. And then you can use that cash to reinvest both in organic growth as well as potential acquisitions that are value creative. And there's another component here which can come into play, which is that when a company in this mold is working well, um, it may have an equity cost of capital that is favorable to acquisition. So in other words, if a company is trading in the market for 12 times EBITDA because people perceive it as a good business that's run by a good capital allocator that's growing, they may be able to buy smaller peers for four times EBITDA. If you have that type of disconnect between one company's cost of capital and then the cost of deals available to them, 
that can create a pretty powerful flywheel. So again, going back to Watsco, HVAC, servicing and installation, et cetera, you can go buy small HVAC companies for very low multiples. But if you're trading in the public markets with a real equity currency, you can use that currency at times. So that's one thing that's interesting, again, about the armor holding story is he was creative in the capital that he used to build this business. And if you look back, the share count went up by almost 4x over the course of this 100 plus X in the stock price. And so there was a lot of dilution. He started with X shares and wound it up with 4X, the number of shares. But because he was doing really accretive things with the equity issuance along the way, it still created this amazing result. At other times he would buy back stock. And so I think, again, there's a mental flexibility just as I have as a portfolio manager, good corporate managers have, there's times to buy back stock, there's times to issue stock. There's times to invest in organic growth. There's times to do M&A. And so I think that it's rare that you have a really great manager with this skill set to think across all of these different vectors. But when you do, it can create a powerful result. And so that's why I think management is critical in these types of investments. You really need an alignment and the right type of thinker because a lot of corporate managers are just good at running their business. They're good at operating, cutting costs, et cetera. And capital allocation is an afterthought. And so I think that, you know, these buy and build stories, capital allocation is a critical component of their success and needs to really be a primary skill set of the leader of the business for it to work. Which is super hard to underwrite, but I think it's a great point there, which is, you know, inherently these are, I don't know if you want to say the word risky, but these are higher risk strategy. And so one of the ways to de-risk that is clearly by having a great manager there, by having someone that can pull on all these levers at the right time. One of the things that I also wanted to talk about was, so inherent in this idea of buy and build is buying. And, you know, typically when conventional wisdom on acquisitions would suggest that most acquisitions don't work out, you know, most acquisitions don't end up being accretive. They end up being all things considered neutral to value destructive at times. And I know I think we focus probably too much on the value destructive acquisitions, but are there examples you can think of of buy and build strategies gone wrong that can help elucidate or draw out what it takes to do a buy and build strategy right? Or I guess thoughts on how that goes off the rails and how a company can be successfully good time and time again at doing these acquisitions. I think that this concept of a levered roll-up, which is maligned in some cases, is very similar to this. And some could say like, well, you're just talking about levered roll-ups. You know, there's no difference. It's just a difference in term, but not a difference in action between a levered roll-up and a buy and build strategy. Probably the most famous recent example of a levered roll-up or buy and build strategy gone awry is Valiant. A lot of people thought that Valiant Pharmaceuticals was run by an outsider CEO, an owner operator, an excellent capital allocator, and turned out to be a disaster. So I think there are some nuances that I think are important to try to pay attention to, but there are risks. And so I think leverage is a key component. Alignment is a key component. This concept of skin in the game, you know, do you have your own money and a meaningful portion of your own money invested alongside your shareholders or in the case of a fund manager like myself invested alongside one's LPs? If I had to point to the number one area where these things go wrong, it's with the use of leverage. So Claris, for example, the current Warren Candor's vehicle has very little debt. It's done this strategy by using cash flow to make acquisitions rather than take on a lot of debt. I think the debt is probably a half a turn or something on this year's numbers. Whereas you see cyclical companies pursuing this strategy, like there's been a number in trucking, I think, like trucking companies are buying smaller truck businesses and you get levered four or five times and then you get a downturn and your EBITDA gets cut in half. So then you're levered eight times and the whole thing falls apart. And so again, Turning Point Brands is another example. It's a very stable core business. Some of their businesses date back 150 years. So you have this very, very stable core business that can support some leverage. And there is a little bit of leverage there, but they haven't gone to the extremes that you see in some of these things that blow up. So I'd say the number one way that you can get in trouble with this kind of strategy is through excess leverage. Then that Claris example is fascinating because they employ such little leverage because getting leverage, especially if you, you know, or I think the bar has fallen so low, I was going to say <laughs> as long as you're profitable, but I don't even know if that's the case anymore. But leverage is so easy now. So I'm guessing some of that is potentially lessons learned. Some of that's just, I don't know, wanting to pursue a little bit of a less risky strategy. But there's something pretty remarkable there about the fact that they are acquiring and growing, but they're using such little leverage. It seems like a lot of discipline. 
I think discipline is actually the right word. It's a critical component here is having the discipline to know a good deal from a bad deal. And not a lot of managers can pull this off. I mean, again, I think you're right. The statistics are very clear that the majority of corporate M&A is not value creating. It's neutral to destructive. And so I think that you know, in the world of companies that are doing acquisitions, I think that you're right. As an investor, you have to be careful to choose the right ones. And it can be very powerful when it works and with the right managers. And so I view myself as investing alongside some of these managers and it comes back to something we talked about earlier is, you know, what are the signposts for success and in an investment that you need to lay out a priori as an investor? And one of those is doing good deals, you know? So I think if you're invested in one of these companies and they do a deal that doesn't make sense, that needs to be a pretty immediate red flag that this is not what I thought it was. I'd love to talk a little bit about the companies that two of those examples own in particular. And I think the ones that I've been fascinated about just by learning more about them is Claris and then Turning Point Brands. Can you talk a little bit about those brands? And I guess one thing I'm curious about is how much of what led you to invest in these is the sub brands and how much of it was just the kind of overarching management strategy? With respect to Claris, it was really me following Warren Canders into his next public venture. It actually came about through a special situation as well. So in 2015, the primary brand in Claris is Black Diamond Equipment. So this is a company that makes climbing harnesses and ice axes, climbing shoes, apparel, carabiners, backpacking backpacks, things that are used in our neck of the wood here in the Denver Boulder Corridor. So that does resonate with me, right? Like I grew up doing all of these sports. I still climb. My six and 10 year old daughters are on the climbing team here. So the brand resonates with me, but really it was the manager that drew me to this. But the way that the opportunity to invest came about was that he put the business up for sale in 2015. It owned a couple of other brands at the time as well. It owned Gregory Backpack and POC, POC, helmets. And rather than sell the whole business, he wound up only selling two out of the three pieces. So I think a lot of arbitrageurs had come into the stock. You know, the stock was around $10 a share and they were hoping he would sell it for 12. You know, they were hoping for this little 20% pop. And instead, when he said, you know what, we're going to sell two, we're going to take this cash, we're going to reinvest, focus on the core black diamond business. Like I said, a lot of the arbitrageurs just sold out price agnostic. They were forced sellers in a way when their thesis changed from being a quick arbitrage to now a multi-year turnaround or multi-year investment cycle. So the stock fell not just from 10 to where it was prior to the hope that it would be sold around seven, but it wound up falling all the way to $4 a share. So there's this dramatic reaction to this lack of a deal, but it was still the same core business. And, you know, Black Diamond has been around for 50 plus years. It was founded by Yvonne Chouinard, who founded Patagonia. This was the original Chouinard Mountain Equipment, the hard goods business. So you have this legacy business, great brand reputation, 50 year brand that because of this corporate event, was trading at a very cheap price. And at the same time, it had a fantastic capital allocator at the helm. And so the stars really aligned there on this one. So I guess I would contrast that a little bit with Turning Point Brands with respect to how I came across it. And this was one where the brands helped me underwrite it more so than the management at first. But as I said, I, the opportunity to invest in this at what I thought was a favorable price came about because it was a broken IPO as well. And so the core brands and Turning Point Brands are ZigZag, which makes um, rolling papers, right? So roll your own cigarettes or roll your own cannabis products as well as chewing tobacco and moist snuff and various oral tobacco products. And they have a number of brands that date back, as I said, 100 plus years, Beech Nut, and then Stoker's is maybe 70 years. Yeah, you know, these really historic brands, hundreds of millions of dollars probably of advertising that's been spent on these brands over the decades. And it was very levered. So because it was such a stable business, the prior owners were running turning point brands with six turns of leverage. And if you look at the S1, and I did this, it showed the prior five years of EBITDA leading up to the IPO. And it was $50 million plus or minus $2 million every year for five years. And so they had levered it up six times, 300 million of debt against that 50 million of EBITDA. And so the IPO was a deleveraging event. They were raising capital to delever. The primary shareholder was buying shares on the IPO at the IPO price. So typically with an IPO, you see the insiders selling shares. They're taking some money off the table. In this case, the primary owner was buying more at the same price that IPO investors were getting. And then it was a broken deal. Like I said, it priced at, I forget, 10, and it traded down to seven or eight. 
like right out of the gate. And so I thought it was kind of this aligning of the stars of this unusual IPO situation where the major shareholder was, was buying more. There was a delevering event, which was going to allow the company to reinvest in its brands and pursue this buy and build strategy from a much less levered point of view. And then you have this broken deal, which creates a great price. And so that's one where all of those factors were the primary factors. And then over the last several years, I've been, been able to get more comfortable with management and their capital allocation prowess as they've done great deals. This is a perfect example. There's a lot of different elements that we could talk about with Turning Point. But if you're a small, you know, quote unquote, mom and pop tobacco producer with a subscale brand, you're competing against Philip Morris, Altria, you're competing against these majors. And there are increasing regulatory burdens, right? That the FDA is making it more difficult for small brands to exist. There aren't a lot of buyers. You can't sell to Philip Morris because they don't care about your 4 million of EBITDA, but Turning Point does. And so the average purchase price that Turning Point has been able to pay for some small bolt-on brands has been very favorable. So again, with Turning Point, you have this dynamic of they can trade in the open market at 10 or 12 times EBITDA, which still seems very cheap or reasonable for a company with this kind of stability and organic growth prospects. But they've bought businesses for four to seven times EBITDA. The first deal they did out of the gate was a small regional tobacco brand and they paid four times EBITDA. And so I think that's an example of this flywheel. They actually haven't issued equity to do these. They've issued a convert. So I still think it manifests itself in their low cost of capital. But the idea is that they have been able to buy things very cheaply because of the structure of the industry. I love both of those examples. And one of the things I love there, and you touched on it earlier, and I thought it would be great to come back around to it, is just this concept of kind of value versus growth and how rather than versus, you can have value and growth. And I think in both of those, what I love is there's clearly a value element where something was broken, there was some sort of a mispricing element to both of those companies, both of those securities. And then at the same time, there's obviously these enormous growth prospects, some sort of a value component existing and potentially still existing. And also in this same company, a growth component exists. Can you talk about, I guess, your view of that value and growth and just any kind of meta thoughts on how you think about those two things and are they really different? I think a lot of people's minds just go haywire when they start thinking about this value versus growth debate. It's this Charlie Munger quote, right? Or the Buffett quote, all sensible investing is value investing. You want to get more than you're paying for. And growth is an input. Growth is an input into the value of a company. I love growth, right? I'm a value investor. I'll say that. I'll admit that. Maybe it's been a dirty word over the last couple of years, but growth is an input into valuing a company. So are margins. So are returns on capital. So are a lot of other things. I talk about this idea of buying compounders priced like cigar butts, right? Like com companies that can compound value, can grow organically, but they're priced for some reason like a cigar butt. And I think that in the case of Claris at $4 a share after this broken deal or Turning Point Brands kind of on the broken IPO. These are each examples where I was able to pick up compounders. And ZigZag, both of the core businesses with inside of Turning Point Brands, ZigZag and Stokers, are growing double digits. These are 10% plus top line growth rates on top of the stability, expanding regionally, expanding markets. It's great. And same thing with Black Diamond Equipment. Climbing interest is on the rise. People are getting outdoors more. Climbing gyms and indoor climbing are becoming more popular. Climbing was added to the Olympics for the first time. I think it was meant to be last year, and now we'll see if it happens this summer in Tokyo. But for the first time ever, climbing was going to be in the Olympics. And so there's this secular growth trend dating back 50 years. Black Diamond has grown at a 10% CAGR for 50 years. You know, it's priced like it was going out of business or something. And so growth is great. I just have a hard time paying some of the prices that some companies that are perceived to have high growth trade for in the market. So right now there's fantastic business models, software as a service, asset light, high growth, but they trade for 10 to 40 times revenues, 10 to 40 times sales. And so I've just had a harder time underwriting the amount of years into the future that you have to underwrite to justify those prices. You might have to say like, this company can grow 30% plus for the next 15 years to justify this price. Whereas I like having to say, this company just doesn't have to go out of business to justify this price. But oh, by the way, it's grown 10% for 50 years and it's a great brand, well-recognized, right? Like it's just, that's the way my mind works. Other people have done really well underwriting higher growth companies at higher multiples. I've done well underwriting 
solid, stable businesses with growth, with good capital allocation at very low prices. I'm so glad you shared that Warren Buffett quote because it seems like the perfect encapsulation of, it seems like some people have an adverse reaction to growth when it talks about calling a company a growth company, but no investor would ever invest in a business if it had zero growth prospects. You know, So it's like you want to have both of those there and growth is just an input. I love that. I love that model. One of the other things I wanted to come back to, you know, we talked about, we discussed kind of covering this in the interview is I want to try to thread together two things. So I know something that you've been looking at is the kind of world of SPACs and what opportunities might exist in that space that you find particularly compelling. And I know that there, you know, there's a lot of different lenses, again, that you can use by which to try to, I don't know, make your own sense of SPACs and what seems interesting there or not interesting there. But I know you've taken kind of a special situation lens to it. Can you talk about those two things coming together and how that's kind of manifested itself in some investments? This is the basket that I was referring to earlier is a basket of SPACs. And so we do own a handful of these. And I think I'll assume that your listeners know the basic dynamics of a SPAC. They've become much more popular lately. For the prior 15 years, you know, leading up to maybe 2019 or 2020, they were really viewed as a backwater. There were lower quality management teams, lower quality sponsors, lower quality deals, lower quality underwriters. You know, the large investment banks weren't involved in these. Just over the last 12 months, they've surged in popularity. I think at last check, there are over 300 SPACs with over $100 billion of equity capital searching for mergers, right? Searching for acquisitions. And that probably means that with pipe financing and you know potentially leverage or additional capital or rolled over equity, that maybe there's 400 billion of enterprise value that could be brought public through SPACs in a short period of time. As with anything where there are that many deals in that short of a period of time, I think there's room for inefficiency. And so again, just kind of thinking about hunting grounds, I think that there's a lot of SPACs that are going to destroy capital and not work out well. But there are also an interesting asymmetrical opportunity to partner with high quality management teams. And so one of the critical elements of a SPAC is that investors have the right to redeem their investment for $10 a share up until the merger is consummated. So I invest $10 in a SPAC unit at issuance Worst case, I can always redeem for $10. So it's a very unique security. And this is kind of where my background in evaluating warrants and rights and all of these esoteric corporate transactions comes into play. The SPAC unit is a unique security and the SPAC common stock prior to a merger is a unique security. And then it has this downside put where an investor can choose to redeem for their $10. And so there's an asymmetry here, right? So I invest 10, I can get 10 back. There may be a lot of upside if a good deal is done. And so I think that I'm thinking about it halfway with the hat of partnering with potential buy and build strategies, right? These management teams are entrepreneurs. If you go raise a SPAC, you have an idea about consummating a merger, potentially multiple mergers using that capital and embarking on a buy and build strategy an entrepreneurial journey. But at the same time, the structure of the securities gives us a pretty interesting inherent downside protection. So I think there's a very asymmetrical opportunity with these securities. And that's why I think it's a very interesting hunting ground. So one thing we've talked about in this interview is just the concept of kind of skin in the game. And, you know, and I know from following your letters that a lot of your holdings you've held for a long time. One thing I just wanted to, I guess, see your kind of perspective on your point of view on is how you think about holding periods. And I know earlier in the interview, we talked about this notion of when you're making an investment, you know, you've got a thesis and that thesis is you're looking for data points that don't just exist in that kind of share price. So I would guess you probably have some pretty nuanced thoughts there. Anything you can share around how you think about holding period, thoughts on when to sell or tracking theses on kind of your investments? There's this concept of thesis drift, which is generally thought of as a negative. Oh, you're exhibiting thesis drift. You invested in this company under the guise of one thesis, and now you're starting to believe in this other thesis. It's thought of widely as a negative when you experience thesis drift. But I think it's actually it's critical that you constantly update your thesis. And you know, a great example is that when we first invested in Claris, I try to underwrite for a three-year double, right? A stock that can double in three years. So if I invest in a security at $5 a share, all things equal, maybe I think it can be $10 over the next couple of years. 
But if a couple of years go by, I need to re-underwrite the thesis as I go. And maybe, you know, now I think it's worth 20 and it stocks at 10 and it's, it's still a three-year double. And so I think that if you go in with a target price that's too firmly fixed, I'm buying this company for 40 and I'm it's worth 80, you know, maybe it gets to 75 and you sell it. But really what you need to do, I think, is constantly update your thesis as you go, which can allow for, you know, longer holding periods because things do change. And at the same time, I go into investments with a multi-year horizon, but my thesis might be disproven fairly quickly. Let's say I get a special situation where there's a spin-off and a company comes out and it seems cheap and they have a lot of cash on the balance sheet and I'm betting on management to do some smart things. If they do some dumb things, I might pretty quickly say, you know what, I was wrong about this and move on. A priori, I would love for a longer holding period. It's tax efficient. You get to know companies well. You get to know managements well. There's a trap of getting to know companies too well. So you have to kind of keep yourself honest and maintain the appropriate amount of intellectual rigor. But it really is important to constantly update your thesis as you go. And, you know, companies can start new divisions. They can start new businesses. Like this concept of thesis drift being a bad thing makes no sense to me. And so this is related. You mentioned the skin in the game concept. I'll just circle back to that as well. What I mean by skin in the game is a large personal investment in the same thing that you're selling to someone else, right? So I love it when my management teams own a lot of stock personally. That's the best form of alignment. And I think that it's important for a fund manager to have a large investment in the fund that they're managing. And so that's how I we have it set up and I have it set up is that you know the vast majority of my net worth and all of my investment capital is invested in my fund that I manage alongside that of my clients. And so when I come across a company where the CEO chairman owns 25% of the business, I love that alignment because I think that you know it's likely that he or she will make decisions that are more friendly towards shareholders, given that alignment. Corporate governance is a rabbit hole. There's a lot of nuance. You know, sometimes large ownership positions can cause companies to be to have entrenched management or other things. But in general, I think that skin in the game is an important element. And I do look for alignment between the management teams that run our companies and our investments. And I love that example you gave earlier around, I think it was Turning Point Brands going public and rather than actually selling shares, you know, being net buyers. And that's something I always enjoy seeing as well, too, is, you know, not only being compensated primarily through equity ownership and having a lot of equity ownership, but also seeing uh, managers that are opportunistic and, you know, kind of being able to see when they think the market is devaluing the business, because I think that always sends some interesting signals as well, too in terms of both their personal investments as well as through buybacks. And so I just think that you see additional alignment. You also see potentially smart capital allocation decisions. So we've gone all over the place with this interview and it's been fascinating. So I want to come back to just a couple closing questions. And I think one, and I don't typically ask this, but just because of how much we've discussed, I thought it might be interesting. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that you think this interview wouldn't be complete without chatting about? And that could be anything from current market conditions to something that you think is interesting that's or notable in the news. I guess anything that is on your radar that you think other people might not be paying attention to. I typically don't spend a lot of time thinking about macroeconomics. You know, I think people are worried about inflation and growth and GDP and different things. And so I typically don't spend a lot of time. I really spend a lot more time focused on the bottom up of analyzing companies. And there's times, you know, during the pandemic, obviously, that was really a time to focus on something from the top down and a major change in the world. But but I've never made any money thinking about, you know, kind of macro and macro trends. And so I think that focusing on micro trends and the bottom up is much more important. And so again, I'll read a broad variety of esoteric things, but following exchange rates or inflation fears or commodity prices are generally not something that I spend too much time on. That tracks pretty well. I don't know many people, successful fund managers that spend too much time there because it seems like it's really easy to have an opinion. Things are constantly changing. You know, we're often discussing stuff that's not actually even real or materialized. It's stuff that could happen or might happen. So I think that makes a ton of sense. One question I wanted to ask too, just going all the way back, thinking back to that question of how investing is a lot like training for an endurance, something like an Ironman and how you just, if you're interested in it, you just need to get started. And then once you get started, you know, you can build that base and start building on top of that. So for anyone listening who aspires to be a great investor and is just getting started, anywhere you would point them or any advice you would give them about how to kind of get started building base? 
I do think that there are a number of excellent books on investing that probably w- form the core of you know a lifetime of study. Anish Pabrai, he wrote a book called The Dondo Investor. I think that's kind of a very good introduction to you know investing. Like he keeps it really simple. But again, Buffett, Munger, Peter Lynch, there's a lot of investment books that I think kind of form the core of a study. But the other two pieces of, of advice that I would have are to start managing real money is different than managing paper money or just watching tickers on a screen. I think that it's critical to remember that investment in a stock is ownership of a piece of a business. So that's kind of a very foundational part of the framework. These are not just little lines that squiggle around on a screen. And I think that, you know, there's broad parts of the market right now that are dominated by traders who view stocks as prices that wiggle around on a screen. It's the greater fool theory. And I just think it's going to go higher and I'll sell it to someone else rather than fundamental. What is this business worth? I own a piece of this business. You know, I own 1% of this business or X percent of this business, even if it's one share, right? You own a piece of a business. We take the approach or I take the approach of it's almost a private equity approach to investing in the public markets. I try to do the due diligence as well as have the mindset of what would I be doing if I were buying this entire business? I might just happen to be buying 3% of it or 5% of it or 0.001% of it. But the mindset is, you know, I'm owning a piece of this business. And so I think that that's an important category for you know people to think about is, do I want to speculate on what I'm reading on Reddit? Or do I want to approach investing as ownership in a piece of a business, which I think is the right way, at least with the term investing. We could talk about speculation or gambling or other terms. And then finally, you know, the number one primary sources I have, we don't have Bloomberg. I don't subscribe to anything too fancy, but sec.gov, right? Just going to the source documents, going to the filings is a great way to continue to learn about companies, right? When someone's going public, they file an S1. There's an annual update every year. So I think going to the source probably as early as possible in an investing journey is an important thing to start doing. Not just news stories that are God knows how many times removed from the actual source documentation, which doesn't have, you know, typically doesn't have any spin and just has the data for you to analyze. And again, some of these special situations, you know, you'll see in a footnote that a company is due to receive this cash or there's a lot of the special situations come about because I read the footnotes and the market didn't, right? I mean, it sounds kind of cheesy. No, a great example is... Last summer, IAC Interactive Corp was spinning off Match.com. So IAC was a $25 billion market cap. Very well known. Barry Diller, Chelsea Clinton's on the board. They own 80% of Match.com. They own Vimeo. They own this well-known portfolio. People follow IAC the same way they follow Berkshire Hathaway. And so they announced that they're spinning off Match.com. And it was really complicated you know, there's large hedge funds in New York with teams of lawyers and analysts. And I still think the market got it really wrong. And it was an area where just doing the work and having the spreadsheet and just following it really closely created some inefficiencies. It does happen in large, well-followed stocks, just as it happens in really esoteric, illiquid microcaps. I love that example. And you listed off a ton of great references. And I think the thing that I love that you brought up, and I'm really glad you brought it up, is starting off with that investing is investing in a company. And I think if you approach it that way, that naturally creates all sorts of wonderful alignment where you care about the business, you care about what makes a business successful or not successful, you care about the management team, you care about the decisions they're making. And I agree with you. I think that is the basis of very high quality investing and when you're approaching it with the kind of right analytical rigor. So I love that you shared it that way. I'd love to ask you the closing question we ask all guests, which is to share a person or experience that's had a profound impact on you and just someone or something that shaped who you are today that you carry with you and appreciate. With respect to investing, I think, you know, the mentor that I mentioned, Warren Kanders, and what he has built and the way that he has approached, you know, value creation has had probably one of the biggest effects on me. It's funny, when I, when I started my firm five years ago, I seeded it, you know, just with personal capital. I didn't have any large seed investment. It was really a risk. And when I was, you know, running the concept by people, I said, oh, I'm thinking about starting my own thing. What do you think? You know, there were people that were very encouraging, but the number of people that actually invested with me at the beginning was small and it wasn't necessarily the list of people that I would have imagined. So I'm really grateful to my partners. Like I said, I think I have great 
partners in this business who share a long-term approach. They understand what I'm doing. And so, look, I'm still a one-man shop. It's a small firm. All of my investors have trusted me in doing something different and looking different. It's not logging on to Fidelity or going to a big mutual fund company. It's a little bit different. And so it's been fantastic to have these partners. They deserve a thank you. For anyone listening that wants to learn more about you or potentially talk about becoming one of those partners, where can they go to follow you and find out more about Moran Capital? We have a website, which is morancapital.com. A number of our shareholder letters or my letters to my partners are there, as well as some additional materials. The way that someone becomes a partner is a little bit more challenging than just going to your E-Trade account and creating an account, but anyone can just send me an email. That's one thing that's great about my structure And I think sometimes imposing some constraints, right? I talked about the constraint of limiting the amount of assets that I intend to manage because it allows me to stay in an attractive hunting ground. The structure of the fund is limited to 99 limited partners. It's a, you know, some kind of an SEC regulation. And so I have a a relationship with my partners, which is great. You can actually email me, you can actually call me and we'll have a conversation. And so some partners I speak with more frequently than others. It's a great dynamic that I think is very different than you know the majority of the money management industry. And for anyone listening that's enjoyed this conversation, I highly recommend you go to Moran Capital website and download and look at some of their shareholder letters. I always find your letters super thoughtful, really interesting. And you also just look at very unique, differentiated parts of the market. So thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing so much with us, Dan. Yeah, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you for having me and I look forward to staying in touch. Until next time, thank you so much for tuning in. For show notes, including links to everything mentioned in this episode, visit danielscrivener.com. There you can also sign up for my weekly newsletter, where each week I send out a single email with all of the best quotes, themes, and ideas from the latest episode. To sign up for that, visit danielscrivener.com slash email. Just one more thing before you take off. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a quick review in iTunes or Apple Podcasts. Great reviews help us land great guests. So if you've enjoyed this episode, take 30 seconds to leave a short review. We would so appreciate it. Thank you so much.